Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Renaissance Society Forum, the final one of the semester, and we've got a good one for you today. The topic today is healthy aging in a digital world, technology-enabled models of healthcare. We have two guests today, Professor Heather Young and Dr. Tom Nesbitt. Uh, a quick note, however, you're gonna to wanna to stay with us uh, throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna be providing you with some um, interesting dates regarding Renaissance Society activity. Some of them are gonna be corrected dates, and that'll be after the presentation uh, this afternoon. Um, as always, uh, today's presentation is being recorded. And if you'd like to access it, you can go to the Renaissance Society Forum channel on YouTube. If during the presentation you have a question, as always, we'll be answering those questions toward the end of the presentation. So go to the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and enter that question in the text box. Uh, again, we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Note, however, that the chat function has been disabled. Now, if you'd like to disable or enable closed captioning, you can do that. Uh, go to the CC Live Transcript icon at the bottom of the screen, and you can do it there. And you can also adjust the size of the subtitles if you would like to. So we have two forum presenters this afternoon, Heather Young, is a nurse leader, educator, scientist, and nationally recognized expert in gerontological nursing and rural health care. She's a professor and dean emerita for the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. Professor Young researches healthy aging with a particular focus on the interface between individuals, family, and formal health care systems. Our second presenter is Dr. Tom Nesbitt. He is Emeritus Associate Vice Chancellor for Strategic Technologies and Alliances and is founding director of the Center for Health and Technology at UC Davis. Dr. Nesbitt is a pioneer in using telecommunications technology to deliver healthcare services to underserved communities. Now together, Dr. Nesbitt uh, and Professor Young lead the intersection of an aging society and evolving technology, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, th and that will include security, privacy, ease of use, the digital divide and affordability. They're keenly interested in perspectives of Sac State Renaissance Society members and the salient issues. And so I, want to welcome our two forum presenter, uh, presenters, Heather Young and Dr. Nez, uh, Tom Nesbitt. Good afternoon, Heather. Good afternoon, Bob, and thank you so much for having us. We're so delighted to be here with all of you today. Thank you very much for coming to this webinar. And I, I want to appreciate the Renaissance Society and all the terrific team that have made this possible and have helped us to get to this moment. I had a chance to talk with your group a few years ago and I'm so glad to be back. I wish we could be in person, but we're so glad to see you. Before we get started, we'd like to give you a little poll to do. It'll help us to get an understanding, and you'll be able to see about your own technology savviness in this organization. So, Marion, would you mind putting the poll up for the group so we can look at that? Thank you so much. This question here is about the kinds of technology that you're using, and it's multiple choice. So please just go ahead and click on the answers that apply to you. We ask about do you use a desktop computer or tablet, an iPhone or Android phone, an activity tracker, a digital scale, a digital blood pressure cuff, some kind of an app to manage a chronic condition. Do you use Zoom? I think that answer will be yes for everyone because you're joining us by Zoom. Do you have sensors in your home? And what about remote monitoring or security cameras? So if you wouldn't take, mind taking a moment just to click on those that apply to you. Later in this presentation, we're going to be comparing your results to what we know about nationally, what people are doing. So it'll be very interesting to get a sense of where you are with these issues.
The next topic that we'll be asking you about is telehealth visits. So we have a second poll question that we would like to ask you to answer. And that question has to do with, have you had a telehealth visit in the past year? So we're interested to know whether yes or no, you've had a telehealth visit. Heather, we have 91% have answered already. That is terrific. Well, thank you so much. So we'll close the poll and we can get started with our presentation. So Dr. Nesbitt and I are co-champions for the Healthy Aging in the Digital World Initiative, which is a UC Davis big idea. We're really interested in exploring how technology can advance and optimize our health and our, our function as we age. Next slide, please. Oh, there's a disclosure. You all probably want to know that we, are, we don't have any financial interest in, in the technology that we'll be discussing today. So the Healthy Aging in the Digital World is a collaborative of a number of different and diverse scientists who are all really interested in working together on the topics of aging and technology. And as you can imagine, those are topics that really touch of many, many different disciplines and the perspectives of many different people are crucial for that. Next slide, please. Thank you. You can see that we're collaborating with people across the entire UC Davis campus. And it's really a broad and far-reaching topic. It's a complex puzzle that requires multiple perspectives to actually understand the issues in the first place and to generate solutions. And so we are working with people across the health sciences, social sciences, humanities, business and law, and engineering. Today we're going to be highlighting some of our thoughts about the urgency for new approaches for our rapidly aging society. We're going to give you some insights into what's been going on with, with the pandemic and how technology really has come to the fore during this process. We'll provide you some practical tips along the way for telehealth visits and other technologies. And we're also going to be talking about some of the potential challenges and the promising future for healthy aging in a digital world. Our population is aging globally and people are living longer. For the first time in, his, in the history of the world, we actually have more grandparents than grandchildren. The first baby boomer celebrated the 75th birthday on January 1st this year, and a baby boomer will turn 75 every eight seconds for the next 30 years. That's staggering, the number of people who are joining this age group at this time. And this slide really illustrates the, the change. It's from pyramid to pillar because the shape of our demographic distribution is changing from a pyramid to a pillar. This graph depicts on the, in the figures, um, in the teal green, those are the males, and in the orange are are female. And each bar in this graph represents a five-year five increment going from zero to four up to 85 plus. And what you can see over the hundred years between 1960 and 2060 is that our distribution across the lifespan is really becoming very equal by five-year increments. And in fact, we're ending up with the largest growing group of the women who are over 85. This is really an interesting and important figure to keep in mind when you think about our aging society because what this means is, is there are fewer and fewer people um, taking care of people who are older and available to care for people who are older. And that means that we need to shift our systems and the ways we're thinking about delivering services and care. Just as in the 60s we needed to expand schools dramatically to accommodate the large baby boomer population that was coming through, uh, now that as we're reaching the, in the late 20, 20, 20th, 21st century, we're starting to have to think about how do we accommodate the greater demand for services and supports and the ability for aging in our, in our communities. As a gerontologist, my focus is on how to add life to years rather than simply adding years to life. And the reality is that most people over 65 are living with at least one chronic condition, such as hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease, arthritis, diabetes. This slide shows the 10 most common conditions and that actually 80% of all people have at least one chronic condition and 68% have two or more. 
What these conditions have in common is that we live with them every day. It's not just a matter of these conditions exist when you go to the healthcare system. And our lifestyle makes a big difference in their management. What we choose to eat, how active we are, how connected we are to others, and how much we limit alcohol and smoking, how we follow our medication prescriptions. And these are the kinds of issues that, because they have in common, are, are issues that might be amenable to support from technology. And our goal is to make sure that not that we can't, we, that we won't have a certain condition, but how do we optimize management of that condition and the health that we can enjoy in spite of the condition. In addition, the vast majority of people want to live at home and want to stay there throughout their lives. And this is an important change and a shift in that we need to think very differently about how to design the supports and services to enable that goal. This has implications for family caregiving, and sometimes family caregivers can be at a distance. It has implications for the kinds of services in our communities that we need to make sure are there. It has implications for home design, universal design, for urban planning, and for policy. And as we'll discuss further, technology can play an important part in supporting aging in place. So as we think about technology, there are a number of issues that are really important for older adults that technology may actually be able to help. And these are things we hear from older adults who, who talk about how they might use technology and how they do use technology. Many people are eager to monitor their own health, monitor the certain parameters. Maybe you're watching your weight or you're watching your blood pressure, um, you're watching your activity levels, those kinds of self-monitoring activities. We also use technology to connect to friends and family. And certainly in the last year, Technology has played a much larger role in our connection with others. Technology is something that can also meet the need for reminding about medications, remembering to take the medication on schedule. Needing and wanting a convenient access to care, access when, when you actually have the problem at a time when, you can, when it's convenient for you, and when you don't feel very well, having access at a time when, when you, you need to be able to talk to someone in a way that is comfortable. Many people use technology to get information about health. In fact, searching on the, on the internet is one of the largest sources of information about a condition and trying to figure out what's going on when we have a symptom. And then also technology can meet a need that people often have about how to link to other people who are managing issues such as I have, people who've learned how to live with a certain condition and have some tips for how to manage. This, this uh, cartoon here shows that even in prehistoric times, there was protest against new technology. And this is protesting against new technology the early days. There's a person working on a wheel, and there's, there's protesters holding signs up saying, no wheels here, no new technology, no. And oftentimes, there's some resistance to adopting technology. And part of our challenge is to think about how to make it accessible and desirable for people in ways that can be helpful to them. Technology can also be useful and helpful for, for caregivers. And in this country now, there are over 40 million people in the United States who are providing help for family and friends. And frequently, caregivers learn the role as they go, and they often feel quite isolated as they tackle complex care. And so technology has the potential to help caregivers and here are some of the issues that caregivers talk about. They want to know if there's a problem or a safety issue, particularly when they don't live with the person they're caring for. Caregivers are often concerned about making sure that meals and medications occur at times when they're supposed to. They want to stay in touch. They also want to be part of care teams and to help with care issues and to understand what's going on. And caregivers also need a lot of information. This cartoon focuses on wireless technology, and it's a, a picture of birds who are sitting somewhere suspended in the air without the wires, and they're saying, it's a bit freaky with this wireless technology. And I think all of us have had experiences with wireless technology in the last year, more sometimes than we've ever wanted to before. And speaking of the last year, I'm sure that your life has been affected in big and small ways with the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, this outbreak is changing our assumptions about so many elements of our lives. It's challenged how we live, how we maintain safety, how we get care. 
It's changed how we might use technologies to promote health and motivate healthy behaviors. It's also been an important issue and, and a, a real force, force for us in healthcare to think about how to do it better. We've been challenged in so many ways delivering care in the last year. It's made us look at our systems very critically. The pandemic's also changed how we interact with family, friends, and with information in easy and natural ways, and how to design housing to assure safety. So as I listen to the news every day, these themes are really top of mind across our communities. And most of the ideas that we've had in our Healthy Aging Initiative have always been about the future. And we found with the pandemic that many of the things we've been thinking about and grappling with became very relevant during the coronavirus pandemic. And so we're going to be talking about some of that and how many of the thoughts that we've been having really position us for the future and for the contemporary challenges as well. Technology is clearly going to be a part of creating our preferred future. And this is an ARP survey that's showing adoption of technology. And in the slides, you can see that there's been a dramatic adoption even in the last two years. It's, it's going up quite, quite significantly. But now 77% of adults over 50 have a smartphone. Almost half are using a tablet. Almost 20% have wearables. And about almost 20% are using a home assistant like Alexa. And then 10% have a smart home, so devices in the home that are helping to sense and change settings in the home, uh, security or temperature, other kinds of things. It's a good time for us to look at the poll. And Marion, can we take a look at this audience and see how they compare? Well, I'm not surprised. This is a, a very educated group, and you're on Zoom with us now. So we have 97% using a computer or tablet, 91% um, with an iPhone or Android, 26% with an activity tracker, almost half using a digital scale and blood pressure cuff. Few of you are starting to use some apps to manage conditions. All of you on the Zoom, 27% um, using sensors in the home, and 17% using remote monitoring and security cameras. So you obviously are a, a, a high, more advanced than, the, than general society, but the trends and the patterns look very similar to what we see in the ARP survey. As far as a telehealth visit, two-thirds of you have had a telehealth visit in the past year. So I know you'll be very interested to hear what my colleague, Tom, has to say about telehealth. I'm so pleased to be able to turn it over to him. He's, he's been an inspirational leader and visionary leader in this field for so long, several decades now, and his, his work has never been more relevant. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom to share some of the innovations we're thinking about. Great. Thank you, Heather. Um, so the idea of using technology in healthcare is not a new one. Um, this is actually the cover of Science and Invention magazine in 1925. And in this article, they said that Within 50 years, this is the way healthcare would be practiced. And think about that, that's before television was even invented. Well, it wasn't 50 years, but within 70 years of this, we really did begin to um, provide healthcare in this way. Why don't you go to the next slide? I'm gonna show you a video in a second. Um, and this is what's done, was made in the mid nineties. And remember the technology, the broadband and all those things weren't available so that the technology looks a little bit clunky, particularly with the video, but you'll be able to see how valuable this kind of technology can be. So go ahead and start the video. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Atterbury. Good morning. Sir from Pfizer Home Health. How it's are good. you feeling, sir? I'm feeling good. A lot better. J.L. Atterbury is a participant. He was diagnosed with lymphoma three months ago. J.L., assisted by his wife, Lynetta, records his blood pressure every day and conducts a self-checkup once a week. A nurse walks them through the home exam and then analyzes the data. J.L. says the machine has reduced the number of visits he must make to his doctor 15 miles away. I had to use a wheelchair. And my wife, you know, it's a big hospital, and she'd let me out and get a wheelchair, and then she'd have to go find a parking place. So this, this is wonderful much, much easier. And sometimes telehealth plays a part in early intervention. It, it was in the, in the morning and uh, he developed a chill 
So um, put him back, in, or he was in bed. So I went in and I covered him up and I took his temperature and it was 100. So I went to the machine and I called and they said, well, now to hang up, grab your coat and him and come on in. So by the time we got there, he was code one. My wife has phone numbers. If she wants to call or has questions, she call and they're there. Even my family doctor, the nurse called yesterday. <laughs> she said anytime my wife wants to call, talk, just call. So you can see how valuable having technology in the home can be, particularly when you're dealing with a very serious condition. I want you to remember this video as I go through this talk, because at the end, I'm gonna talk about what technology can do today that can even make that kind of care better. Why don't you go on to the next slide? Um, so one of the reasons this did not take off, you know, that everybody didn't have this in their home in the mid nineties was, the reimbursement policies had not ca caught up with that. And one of the major things that happened was during the COVID pandemic, there were significant policy changes that made a, a significant difference in the number of visits that happened into the home. Go, go ahead to the next slide. Um, on this slide, this is UC Davis ambulatory visits and the blue line is our, our number of ambulatory visits that we're doing a day and it, it then shows the yellow line coming up in March of 2020 um, and shows the number of telehealth visits. They get up you know, over 12,000 visits a day. And you can see even today, we're still doing about 7,000 a day. But the, the, the bottom line is that there was a dramatic increase. I've served on the COVID task force for the University of California system. So across the system, in 2019, we did about 98,000 telehealth visits. In 2020, we did 1.6 million. So you can see there's been a rapid expansion of that. And it was really driven by the fact that initially, particularly, people were concerned about going into doctor's offices and we weren't sure it was safe, et cetera. So um, that's why um, this, uh, rapidly increased, but it's, it's definitely staying. Go ahead to the next slide. Now I wanna talk about the, the technology a little bit here. Um, so this is kind of current state of the idealized home telehealth visit. So you see this gentleman here, he has his blood pressure cuff, he even has his blood pressure cuff on. He's taken his blood pressure, he's got a pulse oximeter there so they can see how well his blood is oxygenating. He's taken his temperature, he's got a fax machine so that um, if they wanna send him information, he's positioned well with his camera, he has a mic so they can hear him. Um, and that's, this is great and this is probably as good as it gets. I mean, we had people that were doing, you know, with their, with their iPhone from Starbucks, they were trying to do their visit. So this is sort of the, the best that it gets today. But things are getting better. Go to the next slide. Um, there are new technologies. And again, I have no connection with this company and cannot vouch for it. It was just, it was a good picture to use. But I wanna just walk through a couple of things here. One is the camera, not only is a camera, um, and we're working on some research um, now with our colleagues at UC Berkeley to, to make the camera not only see your face, but to take your temperature and look at the subtle changes in, the, in your blood flow, which can measure your heart rate. Um, and so we can get information about you passively. The otoscope has a light on it, it Bluetooths to the device and then can go to the clinician who's seeing you. The stethoscope you can put on your chest and the tongue depressor has a light in it and Bluetooths a picture of your throat uh, to the clinician that's seeing you over telehealth. And so this is uh, incredibly valuable to have these kinds of changes occur that can really help improve the exam. Go ahead to the next slide. And this is important because this is a survey done at the University of Michigan. And this is, you know, in June. So it was, you know, three to three months or three or four months after the pandemic started. And you can see that people had concerns about the quality of the exam, the quality of care that was being um, offered and concerned about being able to feel connected to their caregiver and they had privacy concerns, um, et cetera. 
go on to the next one. So I want to just talk about some of the issues related to these episodic uh, acute care visits. Um, one of the things that particularly today, once you know COVID is behind us, why is the visit being conducted remotely? I think that's important for people to think about. Is it, is it a supplement or a substitute? And what I mean by that is um, if it's if you're getting your annual physical exam, it's, it's, it's important to go into your clinician's office so your clinician can um, do that exam. But it may be just as good for the follow-up visit a month later if, if medications have been changed for your clinician to you know, just check in on you. I put you on a new medication. How are you feeling? Are you having any side effects, et cetera? And um, so that's important. Also asking, is this convenience or necessity? In some cases, it is necessary. During COVID, it was a necessity. But, you know, uh, is there, are there um, aspects of your visit that would be better if they were done in person rather than over video? Patients should always have a choice and we should also consider timely access. We have examples um, of patients who couldn't get into their dermatologist for three months and they used telehealth and a lesion was found 24 hours later that they said, you know, that looks like a melanoma. The person was gotten in and they had it taken off and everything was done, um, you know, in a matter of weeks rather than waiting three months even to get it diagnosed. So there are some advantages for some kinds of care. But we should also consider the cost, not only the, you know, the cost of the, uh, you know, office visit, but the cost to the patient. If you live four hours away and you have to take a day off work and you're not getting paid and you don't have gas money, it may be more important to get that visit done sooner um, et cetera. And the last thing I want to say on this slide is telehealth on demand with unknown providers. So there are websites you can go on to and put your credit card in and you can see a clinician. It's like an urgent care visit, but it's done over video. And I just want to just a caution about that. Telehealth visits that you're doing with your own care team, they know you, they have your medical record, they know your allergies, they know everything about you. And I would just, I'm not trying to say not to do these, but I'm just saying it's much harder. You know, it's much harder for a urgent care clinician to see you when they don't know you, let alone try and do it over video. So I just, it's just a word of caution there. Go ahead. So one of the things that, to think about, and this is important for any visit, is to identify what the goal of your visit is and write down your symptoms and your medication, have your medication list available. If you're doing it with your care team, they have that, but it, they often check on that. But try and mimic your, uh, an office visit to the degree you can. Weigh yourself and make sure your weight hasn't changed. Take your temperature, your pulse. If you have a calibrated blood pressure cup that your clinician has said this is accurate, um, maybe do that before your visit and have those devices available so that if they want you to recheck it, you can do it during the visit. Find a quiet spot during your telehealth visit. Um, again, uh, we've had people doing uh, telehealth visits from uh, an amazing uh, variety of places. So um, just uh, make sure you're in a private quiet spot and make sure your devices are prepared, that your video conferencing device, so you've checked it ahead of time. And again, write down your questions ahead of time. Go ahead. So there are other kinds of, of interactions with, with healthcare you can have uh, via telehealth. And this is just some examples. So rehabilitation in general. Um, if you've gone to your physical therapist and they you know, set an exercise program for you and they want you to come back and watch you do your, uh, your uh, exercises for your knee replacement or something like that, some of those can be done over video uh, quite well, and there's a good literature on that. But also for things where you have to go in frequently, like um, post-stroke for occupational therapy or speech therapy, again, there's a growing literature that, you know, it, it, those things can be done quite well. Once you've done your initial visit, you, they can be supplemented by frequent visits um, with those types of therapists. Go on. So I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about um, 
chronic disease management and rather than just episodic kind of acute care visits. And you can go to the next slide. Um, there's a literature that's existed for over a decade on these things. And, and Heather talked a, a bit about chronic disease, but there's uh, you know, a, a number of studies on diabetes that if you work with a care team and you interact with them via telehealth, um, you can, you can help get, get your blood sugar and your hemoglobin A1C lower. There's evidence with heart failure and with hypertension for these, these elements of, of managing a particular chronic condition. But one of the things that I think is important is being able to interact not just about a single condition, but your overall health care. You can go on to the next slide. And where I think this was done first very well was, was in the VA system, where they developed this health buddy system, where they have a health coach um, and a chronic disease management nurse that meets with someone. You, they capture data from um, devices that they can see how you're doing. They have an electronic scale. They can see how you're, if you have heart failure, if you're, um, how your weight is changing, et cetera. And this has been very successful. Next. And this was, again, done over a decade ago. They've repeated this study multiple times since with lots bigger numbers, but they showed a significant reduction in hospitalization and bed days with high satisfaction and relatively low costs. If you think about it, you just get sick one time and go to the emergency room, you're probably gonna spend more than this. So this is, uh, it turned out to be very valuable and that's the kind of, of chronic disease management that people are beginning to do uh, today. Next. So since that study was done, there has been an explosion of new devices and you can buy them directly um, online. You can buy them in the store. Um, people are wearing uh, watches that measure, you know, not only your heart rate and your activity level, but they measure, you know, your rhythm, your heart rhythm and things like that. Um, so one of the things that Heather and I did next um, in a paper that we published um, about uh, three or four years ago was to sort of categorize some of these and talk about how they can be used in primary care. And we just sort of categorized various uh, digital devices that are the wearables, the ones that are on your body that measure your, your heart rate and your, your activity level and those kinds of things ones that are in the home, like the device you're using right now, which is your video conferencing system and uh, medication dispenser systems and fall detection systems, et cetera. And ones that are out there in the community that are um, you know, in the cloud, sort of uh, uh, Alzheimer's care support, uh, caregiver support groups or Parkinson's support groups or patients like me where you can interact with other patients. Um, but the key is to have those interact with your care team. Next. So here's an older device. Again, no connection with this company, but I, it was just a good picture to use. You can see all the things that this device does, but it's relatively big. And that was a, a, a sensor patch that went on your side. And so it's a relatively big, bulky thing, um, but it measures a lot of different things. Next. But what's happening today is, is making these things smaller. And NASA has been working on some of these because as you would guess, they want to uh, monitor astronauts when they're up on the space station um, and check in on them, but they don't want them having to wear bulky types of devices, et cetera. Um, so um, they miniaturize this. They call this a tattoo. It's really a little sticker that sticks on, but it measures a lot of those things that I showed you in the previous uh, slide. Next. One of the other areas that technology can play a big role is in medication management. So older adults take lots of medications. I don't need to tell you that, but they're, they're you know, more likely to be taking medications and, and not taking those medications appropriately. It's a $290 billion um, problem in this country. So if we could get everybody taking their medications correctly. That would help a lot. And there's a number of devices, you know, uh, dispensers that have a red light that goes off when you're supposed to take your medication, pill uh, bottle caps that glow when you're supposed to take it. Um, there's also pill chips that have been being developed um, from two companies that go inside the pill. Um, 
and they are completely harmless. They, dis they dissolve, um, but they send a signal to say when you took your medication and what medication that was that you took. And so that is uh, something that can be extremely valuable in people that are having memory problems and other things. I mean, all of us, you know, I know lots of patients who say, I, didn't re I couldn't remember if I took my medication or which medication I took. Well, it hurt me to take an, an extra one. So it's, it's a common problem. Next. So one of the things we're trying to do at UC Davis, and this is a prototype that we've uh, uh, developed with our colleagues in the College of Engineering. Um, and this is a, a device that would go in a, uh, somewhere in your home that's uh, easily, uh, you know, that you're gonna walk past a lot. Mo you know, motion detection would turn it on. Facial recognition knows who it is, whether it's you or somebody else. And the engineers decide to use uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in this picture um, rather than one of them. But um, in any event, it, so it, it knows who you are. It knows what time it is. It, it comes on and it's, you know, you can have a, a pre-recorded uh, message from a grandson. Grandma, remember to take your heart medicine, Jack. And then you can press the button to call your grandson. And I talked about some of those passive sensors earlier that can measure your, your temperature and other things about you. When you look at the camera, it says, you know, Amy, you're running a slight fever currently. Do you want me to call your son? So, and, and trying to get all those wearable devices to also integrate in this thing. So it knows how much you walked. It knows, you know, other uh, things about um, your health that we're measuring. Next. And ultimately, robotic assistive technology. Now, this seems really futuristic, but we have just hired a, um, uh, a healthcare roboticist that, that's going to be joining us soon. Um, and the Japanese and, and others are working on some of these uh, devices. And this not only does all the stuff that the health hub would do, um, but this would be uh, a, a robot that brings you your medication on the right time, it checks your blood sugar. You can see a finger stick going on. Um, and so this is going to be the future. And that face of the robot is a video screen that comes on and you can conference with your care team if necessary. Next. Now, Dr. Young talked about the, 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 the desire for people to remain in their home. And when it gets to the point where you're worried about a loved one who um, may leave the stove on or the, the water running, you're worried about, did they get up today? Did they go to the bathroom? Did they open the refrigerator? There are, we're working with developers right now to develop the home of the future um, so that we, you know, we know the, the pattern. We know what time people get up. We know what time they open their refrigerator. They deviate from that. Then it could send a signal to a loved one or to a caregiver team. And so this would, of course, be under the control of the, of the, of the patient um, to who to give access to. But this is something that could keep someone out of a, a skilled nursing facility or something like that. Next. So I just wanna say a few words about this, and that is you know, the, the, some of the considerations. The key is really integrating uh, with your primary care provider and your overall care plan. Um, if you can integrate your monitoring with that, that can be um, very valuable. But how does the monitoring data get converted into actionable information? No clinician has the time to see all of your heartbeats for the last month, but if it's on a graphic, that they can say, oh, it looks like your heart rate ranged from 70 to 90 over the last month, which is fine. Um, if there's an expectation that somebody's gonna respond if your heart rate goes to 40, that needs to be well tested and, and make sure that there's adequate systems in place to do that. Who's gonna maintain the equipment? Um, privacy, as I said, is an issue and patients need to be able to control that. Um, again, but a lot of patients, given the choice of having to move out of their home, would give up some of that privacy. But the confidentiality with, with monitoring is important. But it's also important that family caregivers, that, you, that the patient wants to have access, can have access. And what we're trying to do, and Heather has been involved in getting this going, 
with family, with the science around family caregiving and making sure that they're part of the care team and they can put information in the electronic health record. For instance, if you're playing around with your grandchild and dive on some pillows, um, you don't want you know, the fall detection device to have 911 respond, to have somebody being able to say, we're just, you know, there isn't a fall, you know, and, and be able to put something in, you know, to a health record, et cetera. Um, and, you know, again, what is the clinician's responsibility for non-prescribed wearables? Most of the wearables you have today are non-prescribed. You know, some, all of you probably have some of this measuring how many steps you take. Um, but if you have something that's measuring your heart rhythm, what if somebody calls and says, my Apple watch says something's wrong with my heart rhythm, they're gonna just say, go to the emergency room. Um, but again, that, those issues need to be worked out ahead of time if you're, you're gonna use this as part of your, your care plan. Next. So care is complex. You've got a lot of providers, you've got a lot of, you may have multiple devices and drugs, et cetera. Those need to get into your electronic record in a usable way for your care team. Next. So this is um, a, 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 from a PCORI grant that Dr. Young was the principal investigator on, and this, this was with, diabetes, with diabetics. And the idea was that, that they had information, their activity levels, their, they, they could put in their blood sugars, things about their diet, et cetera, that could be put into, um, into their electronic health record using uh, it, in this case, Apple Health Kit as the gateway into, the, into their Epic record. So there was information, but this is what we see as the idealized way for these wearables and other things to put information in your record so that the clinicians know what's going on. And go to the next slide. So I wanna go back to uh, Mr. Atterbury in the video. Um, where we're trying to get to is machine learning and artificial intelligence with this. So let's take Mr. Atterbury who ended up very sick and being resuscitated in the emergency room. Um, if we knew the day before that his temperature went up by half a degree, his blood pressure went down, his heart rate went up and the computer knows that he's on medications that decrease his immune uh, response and he has a low white count it might be able to predict there's an 87% or some percent that he's gonna be septic in the next 24 hours, we could intervene and keep that from happening and not have him come into the hospital. So that's where we're trying to go with these technologies. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Young. Thank you, Tom. I wanna to just briefly share three exciting projects that are going on at, at UC Davis uh, with the generous support of the Sokopolis Demos family. There are three investigators looking at work. One is around gait and movement. And with the idea that our, the way we walk and our pace and our, our stride can be predictive and can be an early signal of a change in our health in other ways. And it's an, also an area that you want to intervene on early if somebody's starting to have changes to help prevent problems like falls or other kinds of, of issues. So there's some really exciting work going on, some passive monitoring ways of being able to collect this really sophisticated data that could be used by clinicians. The second one is around remote caregiver technology to help people who have cognitive impairment, especially those in the early stages, to help with reminding and, and memory tools, but also stimulating and exciting activities to keep a person very active. Um, and then also connecting to caregivers and the healthcare team. So and using the technology in such a way that's really easy for someone to manage, focusing a great deal on the user and their abilities and their ability to navigate technology. And then the third program that's being uh, completed by Dr. Yang, Dr. Choi has to do with looking at ways that we can use voice commands to control the environment to use technology, which is such a nice idea that you know, instead of having to use remote controls and other kinds of controls, being able to just talk and to say what we'd like to have happen. So these are just exciting projects that are in their early phases and we're thrilled about them. I also want to call your attention to some work that we've been doing at the Family Caregiving Institute at UC Davis with AARP on family caregiving. 
realizing that so many people take on the role without preparation and or have questions. There's a series of over 30 videos, and they're in English, and many are in Spanish as well, around topics that are really important for family caregiving, around mobility, medications, a special diets, incontinence, a variety of different topics. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that website, and Mackenzie will put the, the link into the chat for you to be able to see. And then finally, just want to summarize what we've been talking about. That, you know, the technology-enabled models of care are going to continue to be growing and, and being used in more settings. And we really need to be focusing a great deal on usability and integration of all this data. It doesn't help to have a lot of information if it's not turned into wisdom and then used by the people who need that information. Telehealth is really something that we think has the potential to improve access and reduce costs and quality when used appropriately. And these models of care, they all have great promise, but there are a lot of limitations and ethical issues that we need to be thinking about and discussing all along the way as we're developing technologies. And then finally, that we really continue to look at the research behind all of this so that we're deploying the kinds of, of ideas and strategies that really will make a difference. So the, these are the kinds of things we're considering. I just wanted to also share some online resources with you for healthy living and family caregiving. And then the Senior Planet site has a lot about how to use technology and tutorials around that. We'll put this in the chat as well, but these are some resources that we find useful. Again, I just want to thank you on behalf of Tom and, and myself to, so much for being here today. And we're going to be turning it over to Christy, who's moderating our question and answer section. Thank you all. Thank you, Heather and Tom. Oh my goodness, with so much information. There was, there was part of me, I have to admit, that I don't think George Orwell would have uh, envisioned uh, the big brother working this way, but it sounds like it's uh, all for the best. And I appreciate it as I continue to get older too. Well, we have a number of questions and probably some more will come in as we start to answer these. So let's see if we can get to it here with a few minutes we have left. Uh, someone asked, will insurance pay for the assessment appliances like an autoscope or BP monitor that are needed for telehealth? Currently, that's in, that's in transition. There are some devices that um, you can prescribe, but there are, there, are, uh, there are bills both in the California um, legislature as well as federally to look at how telehealth is going to be funded going forward. Um, and so that's, that's going to become an issue. One of the things that we are trying to do, though, is we're already trying to prepare for a formulary of technology. So a formula, just like there's, a, we all work off the formulary of medications. So we have a list of heart, the blood pressure medications that in our formulary, and we can prescribe any of those. And we know which insurance pays for which of those drugs. What we're trying to develop as part of our healthy aging in the digital world is a technology formulary of various wearable monitors and other kinds of monitors that, that we have tested and we know work so that when we get to the point that insurance companies begin to pay for these technologies, that um, we'll be able to uh, just say, here are two different um, blood, you know, uh, heart rate monitors that we'd suggest, and you could, which, you know, you can choose either one of these, and you know that your insurance will pay for that. But a lot of insurance companies haven't worked that out yet, um, but it, I think it's coming soon. I imagine that's true. Okay, um, one of our viewers has asked if the cost of telehealth appointments are less than an office visit. I'm guessing they're talking to both, speaking about both parties, both the provider and the patient, but how can you answer that? I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so they, all visits are based off what was done in the visit. So um, there is a, a coding system. And so if you do less, if you do less of an exam because you're not you're not able to, to do that much of an exam, like a more thorough exam, you can't bill for that. So 
it's really based on what was accomplished during the visit. So, you know, some of, some of the billing is the length of the visit. Um, for instance, in mental health, when you're doing a, a, a telepsychiatry visit, that may be billed at the same rate because you did the exact same thing. But if you're doing a, a, a visit where if you were in person, there may be a more thorough exam that may be billed uh, less. Some of those are just, are, uh, there, there are codes that are based on just how long the visit occurred. Um, so it, it varies, but, it, it, you know, but it's just based on what was done. Overall then, are telehealth visits though considered to be a more economical use of personnel, time, space, resources? It certainly can, you know, they certainly can be um, because you, you realize, and that's where I think insurance companies are going to begin to say, well, you're not paying all that overhead for an office and exam rooms, so it must be cheaper. But, you know, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm sure that that will get worked out. There are also costs though, for technology support, and sometimes there are additional staff involved in helping people get ready for visits and to make the most of their visits. On the side of the, of the patient, though, I think costs can be less for telehealth visits, not having to pay for transportation, not maybe taking off work for as much, not having the waiting times. So there's some, there's some cost benefits on that side as well. It's really about the right, the purpose of a visit and what's the best way to have the encounter for what you need in that time. And there's times when telehealth is, is ideal, and there's times when you really do need to be in person. But having the flexibility is a, is a great option. Certainly seems that way, thank you. Um, someone's asked, isn't hands-on medicine an important consideration in delivering care? Absolutely. I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's vital in the sense that you having the personal contact and, and technology should never replace the human touch and the human connection that we have in our relationships. It's also important from the point of view of being able to collect certain information about a person, watch them walk, be able to physically uh, conduct an examination. I've also found that, that with telehealth, sometimes for some things, it's better to be on a, on a, a, a video con conversation. Sometimes people are more comfortable at home. They don't have white coat syndrome. They may be more comfortable talking about issues when they're in their own environment. And when I've been doing counseling with people with diabetes, for example, we'll walk over to the fridge and they'll open it up and show me what they have to eat. So you can do different kinds of conversations and different kinds of um, explore different issues in a telehealth visit, but the, the human relationship is always vital, whether it's virtual or in person. Tom, yeah, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say that's, you know, one of the points I, I, I tried to make was that, you know, if it's a, a component, if it's, if it's a supplement to your care as with, with your care team, and you've already, you already know, you know, you've been seeing your clinician for a long time, they know you, they've examined you, and then you're supplementing these visits with, with uh, telehealth visits, that can be good. Um, and again, I think that depending on the condition, um, you can decide how much should be in person and how much should be via telehealth. But as Heather said, there are some um, uh, uses of it that have been incredibly valuable to be done by video. Um, one of the examples, and again, this is more on the pediatric side, but in children with with autism, where you know bringing them into a in a into an office can be very distressing and disturbing, and you don't get an accurate picture of the behavior. That can also be true with an older adult who's who's got more uh, severe uh, dementia, and they're frightened. Um, and being able to have a visit where you're not adding. The, the fear and the the unfamiliarity of a of a of a of an office, but again, you we feel that the best is to have this as a component and as a supplement to your your care with your care team, but not as a, a substitute for all of your care. That makes a lot of sense. Great. 
So someone has said that as technology and strategy are developed, are the developers keeping in mind situations of kind of the orphaned elderly who may not have family to step in or to monitor situations or for the very mild cognitive impairment? Much discussion on family caregiving and some elderly simply do not have any family at all. Yes, this is a really important question and an important issue, and it, it relates also to the digital divide and health equity and access that people might have to technologies and people to support them. This is something that is an absolutely crucial element of all of, of the issues that we're thinking about. And for some people, technology may not be feasible, and making sure that there are always options around for, for helping and supporting people regardless of their abilities. But I think there's a tremendous amount we could do to make technology more accessible and user-friendly. It really hasn't been designed with older adults or people with cognitive impairment in mind in the beginning. The work that Dr. Wheatley's doing it in our group is really looking at that and, and, and switching the question around to, instead of, I have a technology I want you to use, starting with what do you need and how can we support you with technology and what do the features need to be in technology. So I think there's going to be a lot more focus on that because um, for it to really be used widely, we have to have a much more human-centered design approach to this issue. And that's why we're, we're, we're really looking at more passive types of, of, of measuring things. Uh, you know, again, if there's a, a video screen that you walk past, it recognizes you. It, 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 you don't have to do a lot to the technology. So that's on the technology side. One of the things we found a lot of people are asking for this technology is if they do have a parent that's that they don't live close to, but they want to check in on frequently. And you can do that on the phone, but often there's a, a lot more value in trying to provide um, you know, an assessment of how they're doing when you can see them and talk to them on, on video. And um, Dr. Wheatley's uh, uh, research, that Wheatley's research that she's doing is um, developing a, a, a system that there's a, there's a, a joint um, uh, device that you can use that, people, that different family members can see what's going on and they can all use it and all log into and see what the appointments are and what other, um, you know, what's happened today and caregivers can put information in there and family members can put information in there. Okay, uh, one last quick question here. Can multiple people be on a call with many of these technologies? Yes. So um, one of the things that we, during the during the COVID, uh, when it started, when we ramped up our visits, um, one of the things we did was, you know, we had to we trained a, thousands of providers and tens of thousands of patients. But one of the things that quickly became obvious is somebody said, "My mother needs me to be on the call while I'm doing the the visit." And I can't go to, she's living in a place that won't let me in, so I can't sit beside her because they're worried about COVID. Um, we were able to, to uh, the, the technology that we were using allows a screen like this. We've also used that for interpreters, for language interpreters. So we have language and cultural interpreters that can join the call. So you can bring in other people into the call. Um, we actually use that with some of our, our uh, trainees. So some of our trainees are our, our, our medical residents you know they were doing a something with the patient and they wanted to bring the attending in to ask a question you could bring that person in as well so the technology has has uh, uh, evolved to where you can do that because we found it's very important for all the downsides of covid there have been a lot of gifts that have come out of it that's for sure thank you very much heather and tom we really appreciate it. It's a very timely subject, to be sure. And now we'll go back to Bob. <laughs> thank you very much, Christy. Uh, and thank you uh, again, Heather and Tom. As a token of our appreciation, the Renaissance Society has made a $25 donation in your names to the Seth Nelson Emergency Grant Fund on behalf of those students in need of financial assistance. 
Now, uh, a reminder again, today's presentation was recorded for your convenience and can be accessed by going to the Renaissance Society website, or you may go to our forum channel on YouTube. Um, this is the first of the month, so we want to remind you that the food pantry students could use our membership's ongoing support. So if you can, contribute what you can to help keep them afloat by donating to the website on your screen. I'll leave that up here for just a moment longer. Bob, this is Marion. You're not sharing your screen. You have that important information to share. I hit the share button. So let me try it this way. Okay. Now, can you see that? No, not yet. <laughs> yeah, technology, isn't it wonderful? Yes. Okay, let's try this. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Marion. No, yes. I don't, I don't get a do-over though, do I? Okay. Uh, so I do have some important information for you. Uh, coming up, you'll want to know about this first. The uh, annual general meeting of Renaissance Society is scheduled for this coming Monday, March 10th. Uh, the Sac State Student Scholarship and Diversity and Inclusion Award recipients for 2021 will be presented. Uh, there will be an update from the Renaissance Board on what to expect in the fall semester, and you'll be invited to keep up with activities via Zoom. So that date, once again, that's this coming Monday, May 10th. As you know, the uh, Renaissance Society will be electing a new board of directors. 33% of the membership is required to participate with a vote. The May Recorder newsletter sent out recently provided the slate of candidates. And if you haven't already done so, uh, you'll wanna make sure that you do vote. If you can't vote electronically, maybe you don't have email, print ballots are available on request. Uh, finally, it's time to get ready for Renaissance in the fall, and I have some important dates for you uh, that you'll need to make note of. Registration for membership begins on Tuesday, June 1st. Registration for individual seminars begins the following week on Monday, August 16th. Um, I'm sorry, this is Marion again. Would you advance it one more slide so they see those dates? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm new. You're, you're not going to get fired, Bob. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, the registration for individual seminars begins the following week on Monday, August 16th. The virtual orientation and rendezvous are at the end of that week on Friday, August 20th. And finally, Renaissance seminars and programs begin on Tuesday, September 7th. Uh, these are corrected dates, so you'll want to make note of those as well. So this was our final forum for the uh, semester. Our Renaissance forums for the fall will kick off, a uh, kick off that is on Friday, September 10th. And our first presenter will be a climate psychology uh, scientist and evangelical Christian, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Her topic will be walking the path, stewarding our planet. Okay, despite all of the uh, missteps we wish you a very happy weekend. We wish you a very happy summer and happy Mother's Day.